Hello and welcome. It's Friday and you're tuned into the best in paranormal talk radio. Beyond the darkness is underway. I'm your host, Dave Schrader. That is Tim Dennis, my own Sasquatch. He's here uh, for the evening. You made it a whole week, Tim. I did, yeah. Congratulations. You sound good. You look healthy. Well, thank you. I, uh, although I, I do notice you've, you're looking a little bit more bushy-like, uh, more hairy yeah. and uh, wild man. Yeah. I've got a cure for that a little later on in the show for you, Tim. Okay. Yep, stick with me on this one. Oh, all right. Tonight, Tim, we're going to take a look at uh, an interesting story brought to my attention by one of our listeners. Will Jevning is joining us, and we're going to talk about the cannibal giants of the Haunted Valley, a native legend. We'll also talk about uh, baiting and predatory behaviors of Bigfoot. Uh, Will Jevning, our guest, has 40 years um, involvement in research and documentation of the elusive creature known as Bigfoot or Sasquatch in North America. Uh, William is a two-time witness of Sasquatch encounters and veteran field researcher of these creatures. He's here with us this evening. Will, thank you for joining us. I'm glad you had me. Let's uh, for listeners that are not familiar with you and your story. Um, were you actively seeking Bigfoot when you had your experiences, or was it the other way around? You had an experience, and that opened you up <laughs> to investigating. I, I think it was the other way around. Um, you know, we were kids; we were fourteen the first time I saw anything and uh, had absolutely no idea that anything like this existed. You know, we were going to a friend's house. I uh, kind of bored one December afternoon, went over to a friend's house for to see what they were doing. And we found some tracks, a bunch of tracks. And uh, what kind of bugged us was there were some intestines laying nearby that weren't frozen. It was about 17 degrees that morning. So, you know, we realized that whatever did this was very close by and it scared us and we took off. And uh, his dad took us back there with a, a 45 pistol and a camera, took a bunch of pictures and then told us what little he knew about it. And of course, you know, you're 14 and kind of prone to being interested in monster movies and things like that. Anyway, it really kind of grabbed our attention. And we looked for a long time for weekends after that. Never saw another thing. Did you think then, maybe uh, he was he was having a little fun with you, just trying to scare you? You know, we, we didn't think so at the time. His his dad was retired Navy and pretty serious. Uh, we just figured, you know, whatever was there was there, and then it left, and we never saw anything. So a couple of years later, uh, one evening, my dog was going crazy, and I let him go thinking there was a, you know, a porcupine or a raccoon or something, you know, and uh, followed him out with a twenty two, and he took off running, and I... Yeah, he got up to the tree line. He gets up to the tree line, and uh, he stopped. He was about 50 feet or so ahead of me, and he turned around and took off running back past me towards the house. And I looked at him like, what the heck is that dog doing? Right. You know, he never never took off from anything. And so I got up to the tree line, and I could hear something moving inside of it. So I thought, okay. He would already had a tangle with a porcupine once, had a bunch of quills in his face. So I thought, maybe he learned his lesson. Right. And I thought, okay, I'll go in and get rid of the porcupine. So, And it was right at dusk, so it was not a lot of light, but it wasn't dark yet. And I kind of pushed through some low-hanging tree limbs, and there was a big maple tree inside of the, the tree line, the fir trees. And this was probably October. It was right around hunting season. So all the leaves were off the trees for the leafy trees. And I walked in there, and not more than about 15 feet in front of me, was this massive thing standing there and it was moving leaves kind of casually with its right foot. And instantly I was, it was like being smacked in the head with a baseball bat. I'm like, what the hell is this? And then I thought that had to be what made the tracks that we saw a couple of years before. And I'm standing here looking at this thing and it's a couple of feet taller than me. I, I estimate around eight feet tall. And it was, it was huge weight wise. You know, we, we lived on a farm, so I was used to butchering, our animals with my dad and hunting and things like that. So I knew pretty well what things weighed by looking at them. And this thing had to be around 800 pounds. So I knew instantly the 22 was going to be useless. And when it saw me, it stopped and it just stood there looking at me. So I thought, well, I'll fire in the air. Maybe it'll scare it off. So I shot 
and then I hear this noise from my right rear, and I kind of casually, I sort of turn my head a little bit where I could see, but keeping my eye on this thing, and another one come walking around from behind some brush and walked over and stood next to the first one. It was about a head shorter, and I, I instantly just did what the dog did. I took off running, you know, thinking they're going to be on my, you know, grab me up any second, but they didn't. And I called my buddies. Of course, we had been made fun of by my parents when we got home after we saw the footprints two years before. So I didn't say anything to my parents. Um, I called my buddy, John, whose dad told us what these things were. And we agreed to come back to that location early the next morning, right around sunrise with our hunting rifles. And I don't know what we thought we were going to do, but we were going to track it. So a group (laughs) of us met up there. And in the frost, we did find the two sets of footprints and followed them for about a mile or so through the woods until the sun came up and melted the the trail. So we lost them. But and again, I I don't have no idea what we thought we were going to do if we found them, but uh, we were going to look anyway. That is a great inspiration. I mean, you, you, you've you had these two experiences, seen this for yourself. How long between that point and really seriously getting involved in investigating did it take you? Actually, that was the fall of 1974, the following summer. Now, we didn't talk about this outside of our circle of friends because, you know, ridicule factor. A, a friend of ours who was kind of a, I guess Jim, Jim was a good guy. He was very quiet real short guy so everybody made fun of him and didn't have a lot of friends so he kept to himself a lot and he was very serious about things and he overheard john and i talking about this one evening on the school bus when there was only a few kids left on the bus and he comes over and he says well can i interview you about that experience and i thought well okay you know it's it's never going to go anyplace nobody's going to see this so i thought all right i'll go ahead and tell him didn't think anything more about it until he gave me three of john green's books And John Green was one of the few people who wrote about this subject back then. And I was shocked. I didn't know there was so much information out there. So that following summer of 1975, for some unknown reason, I was napping one day, I guess, you know, growth spurts or whatever. Um, One of my sisters comes, this is probably late July, comes and knocks on my bedroom door and says, hey, there's two men here to see you. And I'm thinking, two men i don't know any men other than my dad's you know friends and uncles right. so i slip on my barn boots and i go out the back and here's renee de standing there and i recognized him from green's books and i knew the guy was world famous sasquatch hunter so i thought wow what's what's this guy doing here to see me and uh him and dennis gates came down from northern washington and they were investigating what's been termed the puyallup screamer events that were going on just a few miles north of my home And he interviewed me about what my friend Jim had written to John Green. And when they were there, he told the Hinden to go, you know, if he wanted to go talk to some of the witnesses in the area. So that's why he was at my house. After we talked, he said, look, we're just a few miles north of here. If you want to come and and meet Green and some of the other people, you know, why don't you come up and spend a couple days at the camp? So they left and I thought, wow, this is awesome. So I called a buddy of mine and we drove up there and. Spent a, spent a couple days with John Green and Rene DeHinden and, and a bunch of the other people there. And that's really how I got started because when they left camp to go back to Canada, they asked me very specifically if I would be their eyes and ears in the South Puget Sound area of Washington State and to help them investigate this. So as a 17-year-old at the time, I thought, wow, that's quite an opportunity. And I took it very seriously. Very cool. All right. So now they've really whetted your appetite into doing this. Did they give you any kind of protocol or what you should be doing in investigating? Not really. Uh, You know, it's funny. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) They just kind of threw you to the wolves. So are you sure this wasn't Uh, just a nice gesture like the pilot giving you the little plastic wings at the end of a flight? (laughs) No, pretty no, you're just dead. You're just you're just out there, you know. If you get eaten, that's tough, you know. <laughs> so but if you only around, get partially eaten, please report back to us. That's right, report back. <laughs> Early on, uh, and right after this, probably oh geez, I don't know, it was it was only a month or so after this happened. Uh we were back in school and um I talked to my buddies. I said, you know, look, they want us to go out and start looking for these things. Has anybody heard anything? We lived in an area. It was pretty rural. So we were all quite a ways apart from one another. And uh, one of the guys said, yeah, I, I heard some stuff from one of the guys who lives out in our place 
and the family name was Clark, and they had what they called the Clark Ranch. So they said they'd heard a bunch of screams, really weird screams going on out there every night. I said, okay, let's go check it out. And of course, you know, we have no idea what we're doing whatsoever. So we, our mode of getting around was if we wanted to go to somebody's house, we'd all grab our stuff and then ride their school bus to their house because our parents weren't going to shuttle us around for just any reason like they do today. Sure. They said, if you want to go someplace, you got to figure it out. So that's what we did. And we went out there and we hiked the railroad tracks uh, from a little town called Roy out to the Clark Ranch. And we talked to the people there and they said, yeah, they pointed out towards the Nisqually River where this stuff was going on. They said, you guys are more than welcome to go out there and look around and spend a couple nights, whatever you want to do. So that's what we planned, to go out there a few nights and search the area. And we hiked until it got dark. And this is all cross country. There's no trails or anything out there. We just hiked out into the forest and we found a little cedar clearing and thought this would be a great place to make camp. So we set up the tent. We had this old canvas cabin tent that was about six feet high no no floor to it we put all of our gear in there build a big fire and we sit around and cook some beans or something to eat and uh and there were four of us on this trip so about nine or ten o'clock that night one of the guys says well i'm getting kind of sleepy i want to go get some sleep and i thought we better stay up in pairs to keep an eye on what's going on at night just as a precaution and we split into uh into twos and this guy, Paul, his partner didn't want to go to sleep. So I'm thinking, oh, God, it's already already getting to be a, a logistical mess. So I said, look, we'll wing it. You go ahead, go to sleep. We'll figure it out. So we were sitting around the fire just kind of chatting. And uh, we heard him rustling inside that. Now, we, we had heard some vocals off in the distance, and we weren't really sure what they were. Didn't think a whole lot about it because you hear a lot of wild animals in an area. We hear him rustling around in the tent. Of course, you know, we're teenagers, so we're poking jokes at him about what, what he's doing in there and uh, or what he could possibly be doing in there. And then all of a sudden, he just about tears the tent down. He comes racing out of the front. His hair is all messed up. His glasses are hanging off his face. And we're sitting there just kind of looking up and looking up at him, stunned. And he says, it's not very damn funny, you guys reaching under the, the tent, grabbing me. And I said, well, that would have been a great idea had one of us thought about it. All right. We were just talking. So I said, look, are you sure you didn't fall asleep and we're just dreaming? He says, no, I, I never fell asleep. I was just laying there listening to you guys talk. And I said, all right, look, if, if something really happened, there has to be some kind of sign because it's relatively soft ground around here. There has to be something to prove what it is you're saying. So I had one of the guys toss me a flashlight and I said, where was this? And he pointed to the side of the tent. It was right behind where I was kneeling down. And sure enough, there was um, this round spot, kind of a, like you take a bowling ball and, and dent it into the ground. And behind that, there was a line of 18-inch footprints, very clear in the soil. And I thought, holy cow, this thing came right up behind me, and I didn't even hear it. So I said, what happened in the tent? And he said, well, I heard this noise, and I thought one of you guys didn't want to disturb me, so you were just reaching under the tent going through the packs then this and he was laying on his stomach and he said this hand grabbed him on his lower back just above his belt line and i said well show me on your back where the heel of the hand started and the end of the fingers were so he shows me and i said for god's sake that was that's a foot and a half long do one of us have a hand that big <laughs> yeah so i'm trying to think about this very logically and then and then the scream started and there was one that was very close, maybe a couple hundred yards away. And the other one sounded like it was about a quarter of a mile away. And they were going back and forth. And this escalated as the night went on where we would hear there were thousands of tree frogs. And they would stop on one side of us. And then they would stop on the next side. It, there was clearly something moving around the camp. And then they would all start again. And then we'd hear the screams again. And it, it just kept going on and on like this. And then at one point, uh, we, we were getting scared So and running out of firewood. So we were facing all four directions with, of the campfire. And one of the guys was looking, facing the tent. And he happened to turn back over to say something to one of us. And when he turned back, this thing was standing behind the tent, look, just 
glaring at him over the top of the tent. And he yelled an expletive and he jumped in the air. And, and of course, it just it just stepped back in the darkness. And I think by it must have been about four thirty, five o'clock in the morning, we were just physically exhausted from the lack of sleep. And we were just scared to death. And, of course, we didn't have good flashlights. So we were going by the firelight and we were running out of firewood and we weren't going beyond the firelight. So we finally sat down next to a big log shoulder to shoulder. and We figured, well, screw it. They're either going to eat us or they're going to leave us alone. So we all fell asleep until daylight. And then we, uh, I, I think I woke up first and woke the other guys up and said, hey, we need to get the heck out of here. So we took off. And uh, and John Green called me. I wrote him and he called me about two weeks later and he says, hey, I'm, I'm coming down your way. I want to go see this place. We took him out there. And we had just gotten out of his Volkswagen van and the screaming started. And we all stood there with the Clark family and, and my buddies and John Green. And then he, Green wanted to leave. He says, well, I need to get back to British Columbia. And for years. <laughs> Wait, I thought he came all years, the way out there to see what was going on. He yeah, hears one I scream know. and he wants to go home. And, and for years later, <laughs> I'd visit Green. And he'd say he'd always say, I'm still kicking myself for not taking a recorder to the Clark ranch. Right. You know, I, I'll tell you, between John Green and Rene Dana, Green was, he liked to write books and things, but beyond that, he was really not a very good Sasquatch investigator. <laughs> DeHinden was the guy that liked to be out in the woods looking for him. Right. Now, this scream, can you kind of, um, for, for somebody who's never heard it, what, what would you say it sounded like? Well, these would start off in kind of a low, uh, kind of a low pitch, and they would, they would ramp up to a high I, I can't even – people say women screaming. It's beyond that. It's different. Um, it's a very high-pitched scream, and they're very long. I mean, it's not like uh, – you'd almost think they're not going to stop sometimes, and then they'll they'll trail off, and then we get this answered. And sometimes they would imitate uh, almost like a coyote noise, but not quite that either. It's very odd noises. I've heard a lot of noises over the years, some very unusual ones. And you're sure it just wasn't a coyote with a, a speech impediment? No, these these weren't coyotes. <laughs> okay. um, and, it, and it wasn't really, I guess coyote's a bad example. I mean, there were some of the vocals that were similar to coyote, but then there were other ones that were completely different. Well, that's a lot of activity. I mean, for a guy to have had two full-on encounters and then have that kind of stuff going on around you, do you ever get out investigating and when you're in the thick of it, hear these kind of things or witness that and think, yeah, maybe I should just be a fisherman? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I, I've spent so many, I mean, thousands of hours over the years in the field. Most of the time it's just boredom because you'll be out and spend a lot of time. I used to joke with a buddy of mine. Um, we'd be up here in Northern California and spend, we'd spend a week at a shot in this area. Uh, one of my favorite areas, in fact, I call it area number four. We see a lot of black bear up there. And on this one, one trip, we were up there, and I kept saying, because he was getting super bored, too. We didn't find anything, didn't hear anything, didn't see anything, and covering a lot of ground. And I tried to pep him up, keep him going by saying things like, we were driving down this one particular road, and it looked like a log laying on the left side of the road. There was kind of a little hill, and then there was a the road and kind of a slope to the right that went down into a canyon. <clears throat> and I said, Look, you know, we could see something at any moment. I said, you watch. We're going to get up to that log up there, and it's going to get up and run across the road. Sure as hell, it was a big black bear that was laying there, oh, and geez. it got up and ran across the road. <laughs> and he looks at me and says, damn it, will you quit saying things like that? Whenever you do, it really happens. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's start to dig into this uh, cannib <clears throat> cannibal giants, this native legend. First of all, where is Haunted Valley, and when did that name get uh, associated with it? Well, Haunted Valley is actually in southern Washington state. It's the, near the town of Yakult. Yakult actually means Haunted Valley. Um, and I can't remember which Indian tribe it is that named that, but it's probably uh, it's probably Modoc, I'm thinking, in that area. I could be wrong on that, but they're kind of the predominant native group in that region, um, or Klamath Indians. But uh, it... Term, its term is Haunted Valley. It's what Yakult means. And natives would not settle that particular valley because of these creatures. And they were known as cannibals. They would eat people. The, all right. What was the, I guess, how do you explain this? What would be the definition of one of these uh, giant creatures? Would it be 
in their opinion, just another form of man? Or was this something new and unto itself? Well, these creatures in terms – now, I know there are some – and this is kind of difficult because uh, I'll preface this by t- saying what a gentleman told me a few years ago. And this guy was a uh, – hey, this is when I was doing some research for one of my books. I was contacting various um, galleries in British Columbia and in Washington. Uh, I wanted to use some photographs of wild man – ceremonial mask carvings and I wanted to give exposure to the artists artists so I was asking their permission to use their photographs and most said yes yeah, sure no problem one guy contacted me back and I didn't realize that he was actually a chief and an elder of the Hyata tribe and he said let me let me he says you want to be careful with some of these says, you have to know what you're talking about he says with each native group it really depends on their experience could be as a tribe, could be as a group, a band, a family, or even an individual, what the whole group, their outlook is on the creatures. And I thought that's very interesting, you know, because everybody's individual experience could be very different, one from the next. So uh, when it comes to their outlook, and I have a lot of Native friends uh, who now tell me that most of their opinion is that these things are man eaters. They're they're considered evil. They're they're bad things. Um, Do they believe and, them uh, to be creatures, animals like a bear, a coyote, a, yes. a, a deal, or are they something more supernatural? Well, some look at them supernaturally, but again, that sort of depends on where that belief came from. Most most relate to them as very they're another creature in nature. All right, so it's just a simple fact that this is just another side-by-side creature that lives uh, amongst us. Absolutely. And in most cases, well, they now, feel but when it's, it's better ref- just to stay away from them. When it's referring to cannibal, does that mean it, it eats its own or it is eating humans? Well, it's eating humans. And I think that comes from, again, when I was doing some research for um, my first book, Notes from the Field, I was looking at what the Snohomish Indians said about, and this is early, this was right around the time uh, white people first started getting involved and, and looking at what, you know, different Indian tribes were in the areas, things like that. So what they had in their, uh, belief system was there were degrees of people, what they term people. Now that's an English word. And with native languages, it could mean something very different. Uh, in other words, I think in theirs, they had three different classifications, the first classification was somebody, people who were civilized, who had permanent homes, things like that. Then there was a more nomadic type people that were less civilized. Then there was the very uncivilized ones that could be considered Sasquatch. Uh, they might call them in, in English a people, but they you don't really relate to them as people. Uh, so the term cannibalism might be something that's a little off in terms of uh, definition also. You know what I mean? Right, but they're just trying to liken it to one type of species. So because it's large and bipedal, it's it's like man. Sure, exactly, exactly. Okay. And these beings, I mean, how far back into the local native culture did they talk about these creatures? I know, I know of natives who told me that they said these things were here when our people came to these lands and we chased them out of the hunting areas. So they predate a lot of the Indians here. Okay. They didn't just coexist with these creatures. They actually chased them out. There was a lot of friction. Absolutely. Okay. Were there wars between these creatures? And why is there not more talked about with uh, the the oral history you know, history and tradition? Well, you know, a lot of Native peoples, they won't, they won't talk to outsiders about things. Um, it's taken me many years and, and making many friendships to get the knowledge I have. And I still have a long way to go, but um, and some people don't even know their own history. Uh, when I when I contacted some different native groups, I was doing some random searches around the country, around the continent, and I called uh, Kodiak Island, for example. This was a good one, and the young lady I spoke to, I think she was just a receptionist at the tribal council. I just asked her if I could talk to someone who could tell me anything about their history with the wild man. And she says, oh, I don't I don't think we have anything about that. But I'll talk to some of the elders 
And uh, I'll get back to you. And I thought, well, that's the death knell from that tribe. So I'll right. never hear from them again. <laughs> well, about two weeks later, she calls me back. And she says, I was in total shock. She said, we have so much history in this. I didn't know anything about it. She says, you taught me a lot. <laughs> and, and I've had other, other Native buddies laugh about the same thing. They said, yeah, that's pretty good when you can, you can teach Indians something about right. their own culture. <laughs> <laughs> and what kind of information did they actually have? They talk, well, you know, some of it's very similar. You know, we talk about different names, uh, what the tribe's beliefs are when it comes to the creatures in their part of the areas or their tribal areas. Um, a lot of them, again, a lot of them are, uh, are things they're The main theme is they, they stay away from, you know, basically leave, leave them alone and, and they'll leave us alone. Uh, some are definitely uh, very cannibalistic type things. In other words, they eat Indians. They tell them, uh, you know, you stay out of certain areas, don't go out at night, uh, stay out of certain places during the day. It's very interesting. Uh, it's not some of this, um, you know, forest people stuff that, that some people like to perpetuate. It's nothing like that at all. And, and if some of the people out there portray that stuff, maybe they don't have as much experience with the creatures as maybe they think they do. Yeah, I, that's what we're hearing more and more of. You know, for many years on our show, it was all of this happy, tree-hugging, lovey-dovey, airy-fairy, you know, people of the forest, the great guardians, right? These Sasquatch. And I think, like, movies like Harry and the Hendersons help yeah. set. Um, you know, the right. lovable lug. I think maybe, uh, uh, you know, Jack's Lynx might be closer to what, what people are telling us. But, <laughs> yeah. it, you know, isn't it interesting that the Jack's Lynx commercials start and suddenly now uh, we've been hearing over the last four or five years – how more aggressive these creatures are. You know, it's, it's kind of funny to me how the social stigma seems to change depending on what Hollywood is telling us these creatures do. And, you know, when I first started talking about it on radio shows, uh, and this is what I was getting from my witnesses and looking at it at a much broader perspective, when I started talking about, and not just, not just witnesses, of course I have my other, my other sources, but, uh, I won't go into that at the moment. When I started looking at the real nature of these things, especially from them being a, a major predatory creature, it made more sense. So when I started talking about it in this light, more witnesses started coming forward and the picture started really growing. And as more people would talk about it in this way, more people would come forward. So, uh, you know, the, the friendly forest friend stuff is absolute nonsense. When you look at it from... You know, a flesh and blood creature that's probably an apex predator following certain behaviors. It fits very well. And all the witness stories really link up very nicely in that uh, in that paradigm, if you will. Well, we have to take a quick break while Tim and I go back into the deep woods to confront another true tale in this. The theater of the mind battle of Bigfoot. A personal encounter shared by a listener that wishes to remain anonymous. I awoke with a start. The normal tranquil silence that I enjoyed at my hunting cabin was shattered with a sound that still haunts me to this day. It sounded like a large bear and something else fighting for its life somewhere off in the distance. I sprang out of bed, my room barely lit with the soft, muted colors of early morning, threw on my pants, quickly slipped my feet into my boots, and without lacing them, I grabbed my shotgun and headed outside to see what all the commotion was. I had been visiting this cabin in these woods for years and had never heard something like this before. I ran towards the sound of the attack, the sounds of twigs and branches snapping as I made my way through the woods, huffing and puffing. I was quickly reminded how out of shape I had gotten. Then, there opened a small clearing ahead, and what I saw was unimaginable. I refuse to even tell my friends this story because I know how insane it sounds, but I also know what I saw that day. Locked in mortal battle was one of the largest black bears I'd ever seen, and it was being mauled by something even larger, something horrifying. There was a battle royale unfolding before my unbelieving eyes. A black bear and Bigfoot entrenched in a knockdown drag em out fight to the finish. The sound at this point was deafening. The bear's growls and howls reached epic proportions. The beast it grappled with, howling and grunting so loud 
as it tried to keep its arms and hands clear of the bear's angry jaws. I wondered what would cause this to happen, and I saw my answer. Not ten feet away from me, a small bear cub cowering as its mother fought valiantly to protect her child. The Bigfoot creature must have caught them by surprise and come between mama and baby, prompting an all-out war. I watched in utter horror. It was like every B-grade movie I watched growing up. This would be the closest to King Kong vs. Godzilla I would ever witness in person. The bear howled as it struggled against Bigfoot's grasp. The giant creature opened its mouth and clamped down on the bear's neck as it held the bear from behind. The bear cried out in agony as the Sasquatch struggled to keep the upper hand on its foe. In a surprise move, the bear threw itself forward into an awkward somersault which sent the behemoth behind him flying forward as smashing to the ground with a thunderous crash. The bear took advantage of the stunned adversary and sprung into action, leaping on the head and shoulders of Bigfoot and its entire 800-pound frame growling this strange, sustained, burping, wookie noise. It pounced repeatedly up and down on the Sasquatch, looking like it was trying to break its back. The creature bellowed again in agonizing pain and pushed hard against the ground to try to right itself between pounces from one ornery, smoky bear. Then, the worst possible thing happened. The baby bear let out a series of cries, and Mama stopped her attack and turned. That's when she saw me. Within ten feet of her bear cub, she lowered her head and began to charge. I lifted my shotgun and fired around into the sky with the hopes that this would scare Mama and baby off. The bear was not deterred and kept its rampage towards my direction. That's when the Bigfoot sprang up and jumped on the back of the moving bear and with all its might pulled back on the beast's head. And then I heard a sickening, muted crack, like a large wet limb from a tree popping, and the bear collapsed. I was still a good 40 yards or so away as I watched the Bigfoot rain down hammering blows to the back of the bear to finish it off. I slowly backed up and watched in amazement. The little bear let out with a whelping noise and the Sasquatch turned its attention to our direction. And it looked mad. Well, that's all I had to see. I took off running back to the cabin as fast as I could, wishing I would have laced the damn boots I was wearing, especially as I tried to hurdle some debris of logs and branches, and the loopy laces caught one and sent me crashing to the ground. I literally ran out of my boots in pursuit of safety. I got in, slammed the door, and locked it. I could hear the cries and screams of the young cub as it met its untimely demise at the hands of a very irritable Bigfoot. I stayed in my cabin the rest of the day and decided it was safer to stay inside. Then I planned to venture back out the next day. I would plan a return to the site of the battlegrounds and take some pictures as I knew my friends would never believe me without them. That night, I barely slept, as I kept hearing the sound of loud thumping and grunting from outside. At one point, I heard glass shattering, followed by loud whoops and bellows. When morning finally broke, I peeked out of the cabin window to see my car, and it was in rough shape. Something had been pounding huge dents into the hood and roof, and thrown a massive rock through my windshield. I decided against returning to the spot I saw the fight take place, and reevaluated the fact that maybe... That was Bigfoot territory, and the bears entered his space, and that may be what led to the attack. All I know is this thing did not want me there either, so I loaded up the car, and I got the hell out of there. It's been about five years now. I never returned, but I do look online to see if there have been any Bigfoot encounters in the area. There have been a few reported sightings, mostly fleeting, but nothing like what I witnessed. I often lay awake replaying the events of that early morning, and realized just how lucky I was to have not been the original target of a rampaging Bigfoot, and utterly frightened and in awe of the raw power it displayed in wrestling and killing an 8-foot, 800-pound black bear.
beyond the darkness. Hey, welcome back to the show. This is the best in paranormal talk radio. Beyond the darkness is on the air. I'm your host, Dave. And that that woolly beast over there, well, that's Tim. Tim, summer's almost here, man. Yeah. It's going to be warm out. Yeah. You've got that thick pelt. Uh, you know, I know when we go out, sometimes children run from you. <laughs> well, they do. Yeah. I've got an answer for you, my friend. Okay. And it's a way, not only is it an answer for your issues, but you can save money doing this. One of our sponsors, Tim, apparently has seen pictures of us with our shirts off uh, and has realized our dilemma. Yeah. Harry's Razors has jumped aboard to save our lives, Tim. Thank you, Harry's. Yeah. For decades, one big razor company has relentlessly increased prices and reaped immense profits at the expense of its customers. So, the founders of Harry's, Jeff and Andy, two ordinary guys who were fed up with getting ripped off, started Harry's to fix shaving. Harry's knew that there was one way to ensure quality. So, they actually bought, Tim, their own blade factory. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should look at opening up our own business. We see a lot of problems in the world. Yeah. We should do that. Yeah. But not blades, because these guys no. know their thing, Tim. Jeff, we Jeff and Andy got it covered. Now, by taking less profit and selling directly to us mm-hmm. over the internet, Harry's offers their blades at about half the price. Just $2 a blade compared to the four or more you'll pay at drugstores, right? Right. So what we've got going with Harry's, we're very fond of it. As a matter of fact, both of us have used it and, and love it. I've gotten, you know, I, I was getting going out and getting those Quattro blades. Yeah. I would go get a Cinco blade if I could find them, a Siete blade, whatever, because you know, I, I want cleaner shave, man. I hate that I have to shave every day now because my, you know, I'm so masculine, Tim. I'm filled with so much testosterone yes, you are. that yeah. I just sprout hair. Yeah. But uh, those blades start to go dull on me quick. Yeah, they do. And they're expensive to replace. Yeah, they Harry's are. had the answer. They gave me one of their kits to try. And I've been using them ever since. Now mm-hmm. I'm buying on them on a regular basis. And I love it because they do. They give me a cleaner cut. I'm smoother. I'm more kissable. Well, you know that, Tim. Well, yeah. I've got skin that babies' butts are jealous of. Yeah. I don't like to brag, but it's true. I see babies in the corner talking about <laughs> it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> you should. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, we, we're using it. We love what they've got. And what they want to do is is introduce you the same way they introduced us to it. Harry is so confident that you're going to love their blades. They're giving you, our listeners, their trial set for free. Just cover the $3 shipping. Check that out, Tim. $3 for shipping. And what you get in the free trial set is a weighted ergonomic razor handle, five precision engineered blades with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel, which I like. I have not. I'm going to be honest with you. This horrifies my children. I've been a dry shaver for 20 years. Oh, my God. You don't do that? No. I go. I take a nice hot shower. I come out of the shower. I dry up. And then I just grab my ah, quattro and, no. and, I, and that's it. It it doesn't hurt. My face is tough, Tim. I don't know if I mentioned I'm very masculine. Ah. Uh, but I decided to try their rich shaving gel. Oh, that gel, it smells wonderful. It does. It yeah. smells good and it feels good and yeah. it doesn't leave my face tingly or burny at the end. It's really yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, so not only am I masculine, but again, I'm soft and, and kissable. Yeah. Uh, and they're going to give you a travel blade cover as well. And that's a $13 value for mm-hmm. our listeners to try. So stop messing around and start getting shaving with Harry's today. You can claim your free trial offer, a $13 value for free. Just cover the shipping to get your free trial set, including a razor handle, five blade cartridge and shave gel. Go to harrys.com backslash darkness. That's harrys.com backslash darkness right now. We'll also post that up on our site. Go to darknessradio.com. You'll see the Harry's banner. Click on that banner and it'll take you directly there so that you can get your free kit. That's what you need to do. And I promise you, you are going to love it. Mm -hmm. These are great. Very cool stuff. Um, I also want to make a quick mention. If you're tired of just being an armchair uh, uh, quarterback, uh, a Monday morning quarterback, listening to the results of everybody else's hard work, and you want to get your feet wet and get out into the paranormal, Tim, and you want to go investigate with yeah. you and me oh yeah, and see some of the top speakers and uh, investigators in the world, well, we've got the place for you to check it out, darknessevents.com. That way you can find every event that Tim and I are going to be a part of over the next year, including the Chicago Paracon we're going to be at, the Michigan Paracon, one of the biggest and premier events of the year, and 
Uh, we're going to be doing a smaller event. It's Bill Chapel, myself, and Chris Fleming out at the Odd Fellows Asylum. You've seen it on Ghost Hunters and Ghost Adventures and Ghost Adventures Aftershocks. Now it's your turn to come out and investigate with me, Bill Chapel, and Chris Fleming. We've got some of the brand new technology. We've got a weekend full of great talks and two hands-on full night investigations. So you can go sign up for it right now by checking out at darknessevents.com. Tickets are on sale. And if you've got a bigger, broader spectrum, you really want to get out and, and check out the world, have the adventure of a lifetime with me this August. Our September England trip sold out. Our Darkness Radio first wave British invasion is launching in August. And uh, it's already half sold out. We'd love for you to join us. We're going to go on the trail of Jack the Ripper, Dracula, Ghosts, Robin Hood, even Harry Potter, Tim. Really? We've got a great trip lined up for you, plus investigations. Two investigations, a castle and a jail while we're out in England. Wow. And we'd love for everybody to join us on this. You can check all the information at darknessevents.com. Sign up now and be a part of the legend with us. All right, we're back, and uh, Will Jevning is our guest tonight. We're talking about... um, Bigfoot. We're talking about the cannibal giants of the Haunted Valley, a native legend. Now, when you say native legend, Will, it almost makes it sound like it's a a fairy tale. But they do believe very much that these beings do exist and coexist in those areas, correct? Absolutely. Do they believe that it's continuing to happen? Yeah, I can give you a couple examples of very current things that are going on. Oh, please, Uh, please do. And now I've got a friend and, and this goes to credibility who he, the man's a police officer, been a police officer for some time. So I won't mention his name or what part of the country he's in but specifically, you know, it's not real healthy for your career, but, uh, this is in the Southwestern part of the country. And there have been a number of things going on there. Some on reservation, some off, uh, and I'll give you an example. One of the stories and this is actually part humorous, but uh, not to the guy at the time, I'm sure. Uh, this individual was of Apache heritage, and he was tending to some sick cattle on, on a gentleman's ranch. And I, I believe this was on reservation land. And um, there were five or six head of cattle in the barn. And he was sleeping in the loft this one night. And about one in the morning, he thought he heard one of his buddies sneaking up to do something to him, play a joke. So he acted like he was sleeping and he reaches over and he grabs this cattle prod, electric cattle prod. And he reaches over and he zaps what he thinks is his buddy on the shoulder. Ooh. It's one of these things. And it went flying off the step of the ladder and proceeded to just go into a rage. And it was trying to get him. Oh, no. So he jumps out of the loft, runs for his life, uh, you know, the, he calls for help. The Bureau of Indian Police um, took like an hour and a half to get there. And it was well known that they would not respond to one of these calls because they didn't want to deal with these things. Really? So eventually, uh, a number of three-letter agencies show up. They found all the cattle had been killed in the barn. The barn was tore up. And that was pretty much the end of the story. It was just buried beyond that. There was another pair of incidents mm-hmm. that happened within a week apart from each other. Two men were killed uh, in one in each incident. And the story, as it was told by my police officer friend, was that apparently this older gentleman, elderly man, had been missing chickens. And apparently caught the perpetrator one evening. It proceeded to dislocate both of his arms, crushed his rib cage, oh turned his head completely God. backward, threw his body up on the roof of his house. A week later, a similar incident happened. How is that uh, not in the news, Will? They, they keep these things covered up, I'm telling you. Who's and, they? And my co- well, I, and I could go into that a little bit, too. Uh, let me I'll finish this okay. incident. All right, sorry. Yeah. My, my cop buddies. Um, well, this incident, well, like I said, was about a week later. A uh, very similar kind of thing. The man's wife heard a commotion out in the yard. She goes out there, sees this thing mauling her husband. And this was in fairly close proximity to each other, these two incidents. She grabs a shotgun and shoots the thing. It takes off. You know, of course, she calls for help. And her husband later died in the hospital from his injuries. What my friend, my police friend, was what he was able to find out was the two bodies were taken to an undisclosed location in Texas 
and and the story vanishes from there. Now he had some direct encounters himself. And, you know, this is how he got involved in this. He didn't know anything about, really about the subject. He gets called on a disturbance call one night. There's an older couple. Apparently, this thing had smashed in their back kitchen window. Uh, the man goes out to the front of the front door to see what's going on. This thing is out there and takes a swipe at him, barely missing him. So my police officer friend takes the report. You know, he doesn't know what to think. Uh, and, and events lead to a situation where... Uh, there was a 15-year-old boy. Now, this was investigated by a friend of his because it was in the county outside of the city limits where he's a police officer. So his friend, a deputy sheriff, was called on this incident where a 15-year-old boy was riding his bike home from a friend's house one evening. He stayed a little bit later than he should have, so it was dark, I think around 10 o'clock at night. And the area is pretty rural where they live, so uh, the county doesn't have a lot of money. They only put street lights where there are you know, safety type positions like on cur curves, things like that, where uh, the lights are needed. So the kid has a feeling he's being followed. So he stops under one of the few lights there are, and he stops and he turns around and looks, and here's this thing, and it's on all fours right behind him. And he said on all fours it was six or seven feet high. It was massive. Oof. So he's beside himself. He tries to take off on the bike. The thing reaches out, grabs the bike. The kid goes flying over the handlebars, and he gets up and he just takes off. He gets home. He's he's beside himself, you know. So they call nine one one. The deputy sheriff comes out, interviews him, and and he you know he's a little skeptical. And the kid says, "Look, if you don't believe me, I'll take you out and show you." So the deputy takes him back to the spot. They find the kid's bike with the frame bent, uh, ten or fifteen feet up in a tree. <laughs> so about a week or so later, my cop buddy. And this deputy decide to go out to this location and have a look for themselves. And he's texting me while this is going on. I'm sitting on my computer. You're watching TV. And I'm answering his text, you know, while we're sitting, while I'm sitting there. And to give you the backdrop of what the place looks like, he said, on one side of the road, there's a pecan orchard. On the other side, there's this field of cotton. So they, they're in the police cruiser, and they take their spotlight, and they're shining it out over the cotton field, and they see eight sets of eyes above the cotton. Within minutes after them doing that, within five feet behind the cruiser is this loud roar. It's so loud, it causes the deputy to wet all over himself, and these two are just going beside themselves. And I'm telling him, texting him, trying to tell him, you need to get the hell out of there, get the poor deputy where you can get his clothes changed, you guys get a cup of coffee, relax, you need to get your composure. So they did that, and since they worked nights, they got off in the morning, he goes home and he goes to sleep. Three hours into his sleep, the police, chief of police calls him and tells him, you need to get your butt in here immediately. So he gets dressed, he drives into the police station, and here are these two men in the chief's office in civilian clothes, and they pull their IDs out, they define uh identified themselves as uh, working for the Department of the Interior. And they did not know that there was anybody at the location when they were there. Apparently, they were very well camouflaged. But they had video and audio of the events that they were texting me at the moment they were happening, of these creatures there, of the roar, all, and with the deputy's reaction to all this stuff. And they told them, they said, we're telling you to leave this alone. Don't investigate it. Don't say anything. If you do, we're going to pull all the federal funding, which was quite a bit of the money for their town. Uh, my buddy gets a little, you know, he's a little, uh, I don't know how you'd say it. He's a little hard headed. So they get in an altercation. He gets suspended for a couple weeks without pay. And, and then when he's back on duty, he sees the guys in town, you know, they're doing what they, they call running code. They were, racing to a location but they didn't have their lights or anything on so he stops them in a little tit for tat i guess and um he takes a picture of their vehicle and i have a, i have a copy of the picture he ran the plates it came back home Homeland security well he actually eventually makes friends with one of the two guys and um they tell him a few things they actually tried recruiting him so they said that yes you know the government does look into this stuff there's it's not a specific organization. Uh, and I know this from having been in the military. When you do things that you don't want anybody to know about, you do it word of mouth. And it's very loosely 
organized. So um, I still don't know the full organizational structure or anything. But occasionally, if I want to know something, I do have the ability to go through him and run it by these guys. Sure. Will, I, I've got to know, talking about more of the predatorial basis of these creatures and just how violent they are, do you go on an investigation and carry a sidearm? I'll tell you what, until I found out the things I learned in the past year from my several inside, what I call inside sources, mm -hmm. I would I went unarmed, not thinking, you know, thinking what we knew from back in the days when I was associated with John Green and Renee DeHinden, which was a very basic and, I, and today a very naive approach. Uh, today, I will not go unarmed. Absolutely not. What what was, and I don't mean to laugh, but this is one that just always baffles me because, you know what, I go to a, a haunted location and I open up my recorder and I want to talk to a ghost and I turn on my cameras and I want to see a ghost. And, you know, I guess I never go with the intention of trying to communicate or find a demon because I don't know what I do. <laughs> but, all right, you're out in the woods, maybe just a couple of you. You're six foot something, 200 something, and you're going to go find an eight to 10 foot tall, 800 pound, hairy, Plus. mad, wild man. What was the original thoughts for you, <laughs> for you and your group? I, what if you, what if you followed the footprints, Will, and you walked up on one? What, were you going to tickle him? Were you going to try to – one of you bend over you know, and the other one pushes him over you? <laughs> well, what was the general I, I, plan? I think when you're a kid, you don't think about that stuff. You know, Our thinking was, oh, we're going to report it to these guys, and then they're going to go investigate. Like uh, in 1980, a friend, family friend called me, and uh, <coughs> excuse me, and there was uh, – the situation was where there were, uh, there were a couple elk that were found by mushroom pickers that were – Right. dismembered and, and the report said dismembered without use of tools <coughs> oh, excuse me cold's catching up a little bit um so when i went up and investigated that i did find the footprints i found where the elk had been killed and all that and i took pictures of the tracks i sent them to john green his response was those are great tracks blah 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 and nothing was ever done so you know, I got to the point. John where Green I, is my kind of investigator. I'm going to send Tim out to look for the Bigfoot while I sit back and yeah. look at the pictures you text to me. Um, <laughs> well, see, I, I was starting. It was starting to dawn on me at that point. You know, I was in the army at the time, and I thought, look, you know, these guys are just. I, I'm out here as bait. You know, it's <laughs> like the old. It's, it's like the old mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Marlon Perkins is sitting in the tent, yeah, and he right. sends he sends Jim out to check out the spitting cobra. <laughs> You know, uh, when I was investigating the whole Yakult thing back in 89, 90, right. we had a nine-month investigation, and it was really intense a lot of times. There were so many things that were going on. Um, and I kept I kept calling and writing Renee DeHinden, and I said, Renee, you need to get here. If You know, he, he'd been doing all this stuff. He really started the investigation on the subject back in the 50s. And I, I said, if you want to see one before you die, you need to get to this place because I brought so many people up here and, and many of them had had sightings. Right. Um, and he waited until after the creatures had left. And I was really kind of disappointed in all these guys at that point. I just I got to the point where I decided, you know, the heck with these guys. I'm going to go out and do this on my own, you know, for my own reasons. I'm curious with the. Um you know, one aspect I've heard is that uh, Bigfoot will often be attracted to women in their menstrual cycles. Now, has there been any real research done on this where women that are, are menstruating seem to have more of encounters than the other side? No, I, I don't think so. I And it, that made me made me laugh a little bit. There was an old story, and I think Renee DeHinden made this up about Do, uh, Bob Titmus and John Green because it was their idea back in the 60s about this to begin with. And Renee always laughed when he'd said, yeah, I can just picture, you know, Titmus and Green, you know, skulking around gas station bathrooms looking for used tampons to go out and hang up in trees. <laughs> Leaving a scratch and sniff for the Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. I, he, he used to get just, he'd be in tears laughing when he'd bring that up. <laughs> but, you know, those guys, 
at least Biscardi's nailing Walmart ribs to the tree. Oh, jeez. Biscardi, yeah, that's, there's so many guys on the subject that just, I just got to shake my head. You know, oh my God. I, 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 I will tell you another interesting story my cop buddy told me. Your um, what? And this is an interesting one. A buddy of his oh, cop called buddy. Him. Okay. All right. My cop buddy, yeah. Um, actually, and there's another friend who's a cop. I know a lot of cops around the country uh-huh. who've had experiences with these things. So this one, uh, and this kind of goes back to the serious nature of this. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, this guy, yeah, I know that's that's pretty funny, you know. And and nobody ever took it serious after that, you know. Right. I'm sorry. All uh, right. I'm over. It's the five year old boy in me. It, it never leaves. <laughs> All right. <laughs> But these guys, uh, he, he was on his way to work one day, and, and a friend of his called him from the hospital. And he says, hey, you know, I, I need to talk to you. So he goes over to the hospital, and here's his friend in bed just beat all the hell. I mean, he looked horrible. And he asked him what happened. He says, well, he says, you know, a few months ago, I, I saw one of these things. He said, I had some stuff missing around the, the ranch. And he lives up way out in the middle of nowhere, never locks his doors or anything because he's so far out. <clears throat> so this thing, uh, I apparently he was watering his tomatoes with a garden hose one day, and this thing come up close to him. So I, out of just um, just sheer reaction, I guess he hosed the thing down, and it takes off running. And I don't know if it pissed it off or what, but he was gone for a couple months on business. He comes back, <clears throat> excuse me, and he's taking a nap one day, and something woke him up, and. Inside his house, in his bedroom, is this thing looming over his bed. No. And as soon as he wakes up, the thing pounces on him and proceeds to start beating him up and throwing him around the room like a rag doll. And in the course of this, and the guy is six foot two, 250 pounds. He's a big guy. Uh, in the course of this, he's fighting this thing back. Somehow it gets a hold of one of his hands. It bites one of his fingers off Holy. and then slams him into the wall and he passes out. So he ends up, wakes up in the hospital. So my cop buddy decides to get some of his friends and they go out to the ranch. And of course, here are these two guys with their team. And they ask him, what do you think you're doing here? And he says, well, look, this guy's a friend of mine. I want to come out and look. And they tell him, you can go in and look. You can't take pictures. Your buddies have to stay out here. So he goes in. The house is completely trashed inside. Um, and they don't really tell him anything about it. So he doesn't hear from his friend John for some time after this incident. By the time he does, a couple of months later, the two of them go out to where the ranch is. And this guy hasn't been home. The The government bought his house up and ranch from him, you know, on pennies on the dollar. They go back out there. Ranch, outbuildings, everything are gone. It's like the place has been erased. Wow. To what end? Why, why are the why is the government hiding that? I mean, they don't hide grizzly attacks. They don't hide mountain lion attacks. Why? Why would these uh, alphabet agencies and local law enforcement hide Bigfoot? The only thing I can think, and I don't know the exact answer yet, um, and I'm hoping to get some more information from a friend of mine. I, I, on other shows, I, I've referred to him as Mister Black. I actually have about a half a dozen Mr. Blacks, but one in particular um, who is very credible uh-huh. is going to, is going to do an interview for me on, on my, uh, my podcast witness of the unknown uh, in the near future. And I'm hoping to get some of that out of him, but uh, it has to, I think it has to do with liability from some of the things I've heard. I mean, occasionally they do send special forces teams in with these guys get a little bit beyond the behavior that's acceptable. Um, we do know from these sources, they take a lot of people, uh, they account for a large number of missing people. You know, people come up missing every year mm-hmm. and, and it's not a happy ending. Uh, right, but there are so many, uh, nasty, uh, outdoor things that will eat you. Uh, that's why, oh, true. I, you know, I, in my living room, I'm safe. I don't have uh, rogue clowns hanging out in my closet. <laughs> I don't have well, Bigfoot. Anyway. I don't have Bigfoot. <laughs> I don't have snakes and spiders. Uh, the outdoors will kill you. Uh, well, I don't know if you're aware of this, but if oh, yeah. if you've got this, I mean, you know, they don't send in um, special forces teams to take down a rogue bear. They send in uh, animal control. Why aren't they right. treating these 
these creatures the same way? Why do they get? And I just I know you don't have an answer, but why do what you, you've got to speculate on this? You got to sit and sit around talking with your other Bigfoot buddies, uh, chatting about why they do this, or even all the cops you know. What what are they told? What's their protocol? Well, again, my my cop buddy I've talked about here. One of his friends, he's he was retired army also before uh-huh. he became a police officer, and he was special forces, you know, combat veteran. That's why I, I listen to the guy because he has a lot of credibility, a lot of experience. One of his friends, uh, in group as they term it, you know, one of another one of the other special forces groups, uh, was actually tasked at one time to go after one of these things and kill it. It took them a long time, and, and apparently part of the briefing was not to get within arm's reach of one of these things. And they said it took them a long time to pursue it because they're extremely fast. They're very intelligent. uh, And it was with others. They actually cornered it at one point and they said it wasn't even a particular round size. It was just sheer volume uh, of bullets to kill this thing. It was, it was extremely difficult. Um, And apparently, you know, the, the directive not to get within arm's reach was very good because uh, previously, Apparently, a team was sent out. Someone got too close, and either the, an arm was ripped off or it was killed. I mean, obviously, you don't want to get too close to a dangerous animal because you're going to get killed. But um, if it bleeds, we can kill it. Yeah, this is true. This is true. <laughs> now, when it comes to a liability issue, and I'll give you an example um, in south of Mount St. Helens, not far from Yalcold, as a matter of fact, mm-hmm. there was a campground there. And I know the camp because I know that area pretty well. Um, There was a lady up there about a year or so ago doing a vision quest. And I don't know if she's a native lady or not. I I don't recall. But um, she vanishes from the camp. No, nobody else was up there. It's a little used campground. Right. Uh, There was a big search conducted. And a friend of mine who is Sioux Indian was up there tracking. And he called me and he says, he says, look, she just vanished. And we both know that area pretty well. And he says, you know what happened? And I said, well, I have my suspicions. So... I contacted one of my contacts, and what I was told was the official story was that she was never found, but they did find her, or what was left of her. Uh, She was found 18 miles slightly northwest of where she vanished, and all that was found was her skull cap and a few fingers and toes. Apparently, they don't like fingers and toes, but uh, they knew it was her because she'd had a medical procedure done in Portland, Oregon, not long before she vanished, and they were able to match her DNA. So, um, and in that same region, um, a friend of mine who and two of his buddies that were all they're all ex cops were up hunting elk, and this is one of those situations when you're out. And I did find out from some of my sources how to basically you can counter aggressive behavior if you know what to do. Uh, these things are, are very wary of humans because mm-hmm. we're dangerous. I mean, we, we kind of have this artificial construct around us today. But if you look at us prior to civilization, we were pretty pretty aggressive, pretty nasty species. That's how we got to where we are. Uh, you know, we basically killed everything on the planet and a lot of times for sport. And animals aren't completely stupid. They know that, so they stay away from dangerous predators. And we're small, we're not real strong compared to, say, something like a Sasquatch or a bear, but we're pack hunters. That makes us the most dangerous kind of predator. And these things know that. And it sort of goes back in with also the Indians. That was the confrontation. You know, these things, uh, the Indians would attack them in groups, and they knew that. So one of the pieces of information was you happen to be in a situation where um, you were in a bad spot with these things was simply to talk out loud like you were talking to other people. It would confuse them, you know, and sometimes it's just enough to put you, uh, it'd give you an advantage to get out of that. So one of my cop buddies in Southern Washington or former cop buddy was elk hunting. And I guess he got a little, uh, frustrated at waiting for the elk to move. So he uses his elk call and he starts hearing these weird screams and they're on several sides of him. And, Within a few moments from 600 yards out, these things, five of them had come and completely closed off his escape from his hunting stand. Did they think that they were circling a wounded elk? I think so. It was dinner time? And then they realized it was a human at the last instant. So that Mm. kind of threw him off. So he started doing some of the things I told him, like talking out loud, like he was talking to other people and doing some different things. 
and it was just enough to get him to his pickup and get out of there. But another man did vanish from that same location at around the same time. Uh, there Sorry, was I'm just having these moments, Will, of imagining myself <laughs> out in the woods going, Oh, hell no! You ain't going to eat me! I just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, not allowed to keep the damn big, the Bigfoot are all getting around going, what the hell is this guy's problem? Yeah, uh, this guy's crazy. I don't think we want to eat him. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, there's just been some really. Right. Well, tell me the other side of the story. On. You were starting to say another yeah. one disappeared. What happened? He was never found. Uh, in fact, one of his hunting buddies ran into this guy and the guy had been missing. I, I guess he acted like he'd been being chased or something. He looked pretty disheveled. He, he'd been lost for a couple of days up in the woods there. And he tried talking him into coming with him. And the guy ran off before. I mean, the guy was just off his nut completely. He took off running and he vanished. They did a search for him. Nothing. Do you find when you're um, getting called for these investigations, do you find when you get to a place that local law enforcement will kind of pull a Rambo on you and they, you're not allowed here. You better just get back in your car and head home. Uh, or, or are, are most locations pretty welcoming to people coming in to be a part of it? Um, usually I, I'm contacted by private people. So, you know, I'll go in on private property and things like that, but we've had cases where, and, and I have a specific one. Uh, this was back in the mid nineties, I was, I worked in Portland, Oregon at the time. And, and of course everybody I worked with kind of knew what my hobby was. So, um, one of the guy's fathers, him and a buddy of his were retired. They had their, they had a big shop. They did a lot of things. They built Bajas out of Volkswagens, things like that. So they were up near Mount Adams, Washington, scouting for deer one time, a couple months before deer season. And what they did was they take these vehicles they built and drive cross country in other words a lot of those roads were gated off by the forest service up there so nobody could have access to them they drive cross country through the timber to access the road networks to get to the game back up in that area and while they were up there one of the guys was hanging out the window looking at all the sign in the in the dirt and it was really beautiful material that area it's very uh very powdery the dirt well it's almost like flour so anything that leaves any kind of sign it marks beautifully in that, in that, uh, material. So they were looking at all the different animal tracks. And then he says, he sees these little human like tracks and they were obviously a juvenile. They were only a few inches long, but they were clearly bipedal. They looked human. They were going for miles. So they marked the spot by, uh, tying a rag off three. Now, before them going into this place, they ran into a young guy, a college student on a summer job. He had this water truck, and he was thinning timber in the area. So they talked to him for a little bit. And then they drove on and did their thing. Well, on the way out, they were getting ready to put the Baja on the trailer. And here comes this Forest Service truck with the guy in uniform. And he stops and talks to him. And, and they tell him about the tracks. And he says, well, I'd like to see those. Take some pictures. So they told him where to look. And he pulls out this, what they said, a very expensive looking camera from behind the seat. And he gives him gives them his card and says... I'll take some pictures, and if you guys want copies of the pictures, get a hold of me in a couple of weeks, and I'll be glad to give you copies. So they thought, no problem. So on the way out, one of the guys calls his son, wants to know if I will go out there and investigate with them. I said, sure. So I took off from work, and they came and picked me up. So it was about three hours, three, four hours between the time they found the tracks and the time they came and got me, and we drove back out there. because so it was quite a ways out there. Um we got in the Baja, drove off through the timber. We found the place where um, the, the tree, the rag was tied around the tree, so we knew where the tracks were. I found a lot of bear tracks in the area before we got there, lots of deer, lots of everything. We get to this area, it's completely devoid of any animal sign in the soil whatsoever. And I thought that was very odd for the tracks of all the other animals just to stop. And the guys, they couldn't figure out what happened. So I started looking at the ground very carefully, and I see water drops periodically. And I thought, that's very odd, because it's the middle of summer. There's been no rain for months. And then when they told me about the guy with the water truck, I'd fought forest fire one season and remembered the water trucks. And on the hose, they have, they have a feature that does misting. In other words, they can wet everything down without wasting a lot of water mm -hmm. and keep fires from spreading. 
they had misted the road. So all of that soil, and it was pretty thick in most of the area, was really thin and it wiped out any sign of any tracks. So I thought, well, now why would they do something like that with these Bigfoot tracks? And a, a young Sasquatch to boot. So I said, well, get a hold of this guy so you can get pictures and we'll go from there. Well, they waited a couple of weeks. They called the Forest Service office. They never heard of this guy. There was no such individual. No footprints, no pictures, no anything. Hmm. What did they think happened? I mean, what, what was going on? Well, apparently there was somebody who was uh, uh, representing themselves as working for the Forest Service who was not a member of the Forest Service. We don't know who it was or who they worked for, but uh, yeah, it's a very unusual situation, that's for certain. If we know that there are uh, concentrated areas where the aggressive ones live, why aren't they um, deeming it a, a dangerous bear territory, no, no camping allowed, no uh, activities out in this area? Why don't they just hide it with that? Well, it could be happening in some places, but one of the things we're finding out now is the government is buying up a lot of land around areas that are seemingly seemingly useless. I mean, uh, one of our guys, uh, a friend of mine who's who works with me, was telling me that around the area around Fort Polk, Louisiana, the government just bought a huge chunk of land. Now, you think, okay, that's a training area, but it's kind of useless. They have a lot of training area already. It's not a place that they would really need to get, but it's an area that has a lot of activity with these things. So while you can't say directly that's what they're doing, you know, two and two adds up to four pretty quickly. Are there locations right now, Will, that that if we showed up on your doorstep, you could say, "Dave, I'm taking you here. We're gonna hear. We're gonna hear something. We're we're gonna maybe see something." Are you confident in that? Yeah, I've got places around the country. Well, I'll tell you what. I would like to. Uh, uh, be more immersive into this, especially with this kind of situation. And I would like to um, send Tim to go out with you and investigate. (laughs) (laughs) I'm his gym. (laughs) While I sit comfortably at home uh, eating Taco Bell and uh, (laughs) watching from a live video stream on my phone. Um, No, but seriously, I would be interested this summer. I've said I want to do a couple of adventures. And even though they are more aggressive, this is something I just feel like I really want, you know, I I really want to be in that situation to to uh, have you protect me from one that attacks. But uh, no, I I would like to go out and, and see that. Is that something that you would be open to if I kept it under wraps where we went to visit? Sure. I've got actually one of my buddies on the Flathead Reservation in western Montana keeps telling me I need to come there. Uh, he, he, they've got a group of them there that are, have been fairly aggressive lately. They, oh, they, yeah, that sounds better. Or, a group. Let's do that. That sounds good. I'm, yeah, I'm well, tender and meaty. They're, they're mad because they're messing up their hunting areas. <laughs> oh, and uh, he told me that. And he showed, sent me a picture of his pickup. One of these things threw a chunk of wood and dented the heck out of his truck. Yeah. Yeah, maybe not that one. Do you have one where there's a kind of like a retiree <laughs> village of Bigfoot that are, you know, arthritic and no teeth left? They'll gum me to death for a half an hour. Uh, uh, that would be a much better location for me to uh, to I, investigate. I, I don't think I have one of those, but <laughs> are there are there different um, races? I mean, we know d- different bears are are more aggressive than others. Uh, different types, absolutely. Right. Are, are there? Are there hippie Bigfoot that are more like, hey, man, you got some pineapple rinder in there? You know? <laughs> I mean, as opposed to the uh, coming in and beating you to death in your own bedroom kind of Bigfoot. What 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 do we know about that? I mean. Well, there, there are two major groupings. Mm-hmm. And this is something Dr. John Napier back in the 70s realized with footprints early on was that he felt that there were two genera of these creatures. And it's exactly what there is. There's two groupings. Uh, and they based them on footprints. They said there was one one had a footprint that was sort of an hourglass shape, and the other one was a more human-looking type footprints. Well, again, through my sources, I found out that there are, in fact, four types with two subgroupings in each one of those types. Uh, and for the lack of terminology, we'll just say, you know, species group A and species group B. In species group A, we have type 1s and 4s. The type 1 is what you see in the Patterson film. Uh, the type four is much smaller. It's what's mostly in the northeastern part of the country. Uh, Andriandra, Andion, I can't say it. Andriandak Mountains in New York, places like that. Uh, 
witnesses would liken them more to what I think what we would think of as maybe like a Neanderthal looking creature. They're smaller, they're more proportion uh, to humans than the other three kinds. The other three kinds are all the massive things that we talk about. Again, like what you see in the Patterson film, which isn't a particularly large one. Uh, the difference being, you know, behaviorally, they're not quite as aggressive as the other species group. Uh, they have blocky teeth, no canines, things like that. Um, walk predominantly upright. Species group B that has the type twos and threes, um, very, very aggressive, much more so than the other groupings. Uh, they have very large canines, uppers and lowers. They'll move on all fours as comfortably as they do bipedally. The type three has an elongated face like we see in other primates. And they're predominantly along the Mississippi River drainage. They're not really anywhere else in the country, but uh, the type twos are predominantly in the southern part of the U.S. Well, let's find the uh, type six, the really lazy ones that just want to <laughs> mellow out and listen to Floyd with me or something. <laughs> I, uh, I I do want to go out and experience that. So let's keep in touch. Um and sure. uh, see what we can do because I'd like sometime this year to go out and be on an actual investigation where it's an, an active hotspot, not one where, well, it's pretty active. We, we found footprints here three years ago. I want to know where there's something going on right now. I have stuff all over the country. All right. Let's do that uh, and, and talk about that. Certainly, um, the the violence and attacks, are we, are we hearing more and more of these, do you think, because it's so much easier to connect and people can – uh, anonymously report them via the internet, uh, or do you think that no these these cases have always occurred? People just uh, never talked about it. I think it's a combination. The population's bigger, and that's largely due to logging. Mm-hmm. Um, just a little bit on that logging. You know, everybody kind of wigged out about logging in the seventies and eighties. You know, because we're logging all the land. Well, forests grow back. It's, that's not really the issue. Uh, what it caused. When you log an area, it makes sunlight accessible to the ground, which means all the leafy plants grow like crazy. So deer populations explode, other animals populations explode, and so do the predator populations. So the population of these things is larger today than it was, say, in the 60s. Uh, so there's more incidents that go on. People are seeing and encountering things more. Things have happened in the past like this. There was an older gentleman and his daughter contacted me a couple of years ago. And in 1949, he saw one of these things while driving somewhere one night. And this creature had an older lady hanging, draped over his arm. You know, she vanished. Apparently, it took her and probably ate her. So these things have gone on. They just haven't been reported a lot. They're reported more so now, I think, because of the access availability. And then people like me who say, look, these things are what people are reporting. And when they hear that, it makes them a little bit more comfortable to come forward and say something. Not everybody will say it publicly. I've had a lot of people, a lot of times because of their professional positions, won't say anything or don't want their names out, Mm -hmm. but just need to get it off their chest. What do you make of these people that claim that they have had very good relationships with these creatures? Do you think it's because most of them are baiting and leaving food for them? Is that what keeps these creatures happy and at bay? No, these things, in fact, it's one of those people, especially from the South, uh, it's one of those things that sort of, you know, Southerners will talk about amongst themselves, but don't talk to outsiders about, uh, they'll tell themselves and each other, you know, not to feed these things because it will keep them coming back. And if you cut off their food supply, then they get really nasty. These things have a very bad temperament. Hmm. All right. Well, you're giving me pause to think about going on an investigation, <laughs> but I'll, I'll trust you that you'll take me to a place I, uh, I have a, a, a chance to get out of alive. Uh, fascinating I'll make stuff. Sure not, I'll make sure you're not made a happy meal. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> that'd be good. Or an unhappy <laughs> meal. Either way, I don't want right, to end up. Right. <laughs> I, I don't want to end up a, a midnight special for a, you know, a Dave Schrader burrito for these uh, these beings. Uh, Will, thank you very much for joining us again, and uh, keep us in mind as you as you gather more stories. We'd love to hear about different encounters and how can people listen to your podcast and catch up with you. Well, thanks for having me, Dave. Uh, they can go to my website williamjabning dot com, or they can check out the podcast on Podbean. It's Witness of the Unknown.
All right. You've heard it here. We'll have links up to it as well so that you can check it out and uh, go check out darknessradio.com. You can visit all of our sponsors and all of our guests and find information on everything you hear about on our show. We'll be back Monday. We've got Supernatural News and Parashare in line for you, and we'd love uh, for you guys to be back with us then. And remember, I'll be back hosting Coast to Coast AM on April 8th. And uh, if you want more of the best of strange and fringe news and stories like you hear on Beyond the Darkness, you can check out George Norrie and the cast of Coast to Coast AM seven days a week. Go check it out, Coast to Coast AM. You'll find stations in your area, topics, and everything that's going on tonight. Regular contributor to our show and to Coast to Coast AM, Joshua P. Warren joins George Norrie. Uh, investigator Josh Warren will discuss his new field of research called parasemantics, and uh, he'll explain his groundbreaking experiments transforming energy into material forms to create paranormal activity, followed by open lines in the later half of the show. That's tonight on Coast to Coast AM. Be safe, be kind, and for God's sakes, don't go out in the woods unless you absolutely have to, and if you have to, uh, find Tim to do it for you instead. I'll do it. Yep. For uh, Tim Dennis, I'm Dave Schrader. Thanks to William Jevning for joining us this evening, talking about these uh, cannibal giants of the Haunted Valley and the predatory behaviors of Bigfoot. Fascinating stuff. Uh, we'll be back next week right here on the best in paranormal talk radio. This is Beyond the Darkness.